Okay, welcome everybody to today's session. We're going to be talking about one of the core marketing campaign types, events, and the effective use of online registration. So I want to say right off the top that this session will not be addressing best practices around event planning topics like venue selection or planning event entertainment or dining options, things like that. It is it is focused on helping you learn more about effective event promotion and streamlining your online registration efforts. So we certainly have a lot to talk about with those two topics. So let's get going. Okay, again, my name is Dana Crawford. I am a authorized and authorized local expert and solutions provider with Constant Contact. I've been with Constant Contact since 2007, and I'm based in Ocala, Florida. And here is my contact information. If you want to reach out following this session, you can send me an email, or you can find me on Facebook or Twitter. So this is just an intro to the different things that Constant Contact has to offer, just to let you see quickly. Uh, we do newsletters and announcements, offers and promotions, feedbacks and surveys, and events and, and registrations. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So our agenda, we'll quickly talk about different types of events and how there may be an event type that would work for you if you only got a little creative. And we'll share some reasons for running an event and how to approach the, the free or paid questions. Then we're going to discuss the promotion of your event and a rough timeline you can try for different promotional activities. And next, we'll talk about online registration tools and why they make up an important part of your event management efforts. Finally, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll recognize that just because the event is over doesn't mean that your work is done. And we'll talk about post-event action. I also want to make a quick note about four and nonprofits and industry verticals. I'm often asked how the things I'm talking about should be adjusted or changed for a retail operation, a nonprofit or a services B2B firm or someone in a different industry vertical. The good news is that the principles that will be discussed today are largely universal. They can benefit a nonprofit just as much as they can for a profit. A B2B business can follow these just as easily as a B2C. That a restaurant can succeed with these ideas just as readily as a yoga studio, a church, a bookstore. Yes, you may have different considerations to make for your selected audience or organization, but in large part, we're here teaching the best practices, and they're the best practices abroad. So first, we're going to talk about the different types of events. I want to give you a simple definition or framework of, a, of what marketing really is. You already know generally what it is, but when I say the word marketing, I mean something very specific, and it's important that there that we're all on the same page. So my definition of marketing has three simple parts. You define an audience, a group of people that you want to target. You reach out to them with a message that is specific to that audience. And you seek a physical and measurable response, a click, a reply, a call, a purchase, a referral. These are all actions that represent a decision made by a human to react to your message. So keep this in mind as we discuss marketing and marketing campaigns and the ways to deliver the most effective campaign. 
So first, let's talk about campaign. What does this word really mean? Very simply, there are two parts to a campaign. First, you push out some sort of content to your followers, your supporters. And then second, you hope to pull some sort of response from them. You want to read forward you want so that they can forward it or like it or share it. What you send them to show up, come to your event, attend, call you. You want them to take action of some sort. So think about a campaign in terms of a push-pull. And more importantly, do not think about it as just putting an offer out there and making the sale. In this new marketing world, it's more like a conversation, which lends itself to that advantage we talked about that you have over big business. As a small company, you can engage in a conversation that feels, and in fact, is much less like a sales gimmick and more like a nurturing relationship. So if you're doing it right, it will seem like that from both sides of the conversation. In the case of events, when you're pushing out invitations and more information about the event, you're hoping to pull in registrations, and that's what a campaign is. So when we use the word event, the image that often comes to mind is that of a gala or a dinner with the entertainment and a reception hall. And that's accurate, but there are other types as well. So here are just a few. Seminars, lectures, workshops, classes, education or training, conferences, social gathering, networks, fundraising. So these are just to give you a uh, an idea of, of different events. I know I personally use this for my eBay workshops. Those are events that are local throughout Georgia and Florida, and it, those are basically workshops. So that would be my type of event. My online webinars are events, although I use the go-to webinar service. So now that we've identified some new ways to think about what an event is, and you may even have heard of an idea you want to consider for your organization. So now let's go a little bit deeper into why an organization would want to run one. Across those types of events at their core is that some organization has a reason for hosting that event. Think about what the types of goals you might have for an event. Do any of those look familiar to you as goals that you've set for your events before? You want to raise money or drive purchases, create face-to-face -face engagement, reward loyalty, celebrate milestones, grow your list, educate, and offer yourself as an expert. I think it's really important to call yourself an expert because if you don't claim it, who who's going to do that for you? So don't be shy to claim yourself as an expert in your field. It can be hard trying to determine what to charge for an event, but sometimes it's hard to determine if you actually want to charge anything at all. In some cases, you may not be sure if people will be willing to pay for your event, so let me take a little bit of the stress out of this question. We reviewed over 200,000 RSVPs in which people declined an invitation and looked at the reasons why people say no thanks. We found over 50% cited conflicts with date and time. Another 30% cited other when you drill into the reasons, most of those were related to date and time location. An additional 10% cited location directly. In essence, almost 90% of the reasons people say no come down to timing and location. When it comes down to cost, out of all of these responses, the 0% of people 
cited cost as the reason they were declining. So think about that. Out of 200,000 responses, only 0.01% cited cost. That's only 20 people. So what's the takeaway here? Don't be afraid to charge for your events. What's important to consider is the value you're offering your attendees. If, if there are per, perceived value built into the event and your marketing of the event, and will people be willing to come out of their own pocket? There's a concept we regularly discuss in our seminars called the engagement marketing cycle. It outlines the connection between key elements of the relationship that a business or organization has with its customers, clients, or donors. Events eventually have a place in this cycle. So events are defined, or excuse me, they're definitely about the wow experience but they also have a place in each other's part of the engagement marketing cycle. They give organizations a reason to ask people to stay in touch, which is like entice, so followers can learn about other events. The experience at the event creates a ready connection around which engagement can be created. So remember at our gala when this happened, their web a picture, et cetera. Events provide opportunities for social visibility during the event or after slash before with the sharing of stories, pictures, results, et cetera. And finally, everyone loves to hear about a great party or gathering or a meaningful reason to get together, a fundraiser, or events supported by engagement and social visibility will draw new prospects to your business or your cause. So keep that in mind. So great, we talked about the types of events you could think about, the goals you could have for one and to consider charging for one, and the important role that events can play in helping you stay engaged with your audience. So now, let's talk about the promotion of your event. Studies show it's best to promote your event over a period of time that makes sense for this type of event, your organization, your audience, and their planning horizon, etc. We're going to walk through the types of activities you should consider as you promote your event. For purposes today, we're going to use a sample six-week promotional period, but you can think about how you would stretch these core promotional periods out over the length of your ideal time frame. So we're not talking about just blasting out your registration URL six, six weeks in a row. Today we've broken down your event success formula into three stages. So the first one is creating buzz. And you want to start your buzz factor about five to six weeks before the event. Increasing registration about three to four weeks. So you want to get your links out there about three or four weeks. And then maximizing attendance. Each stage is broken down into different best practices designed to help you achieve the goal of that stage. So all of these stages come together to make your event a success. The one piece of promotion that can and should be sent before the time frame is to save the date notice. Be sure to leave plenty of time for your audience to start making appropriate plans. And that really helps. I know um, I have a, one of my twins is getting married next year. And we are getting ready to, first it's like pick a date. <laughs> Once we get that done, we're, we could move on. All right, so timing does matter. Creating buzz is all the groundwork you can do to get people excited about your event and on their radar, even before you share the event's registration URL. 
So email newsletters are a fantastic way to stay top of mind with your customers. It keeps them thinking about your company, so when they are ready to buy or recommend you to a friend, you are the first to come to mind when you create compelling content. People want to read it and share it with their friends and family. And when they're reading your newsletters, make sure they're reading about your upcoming events. Taking or talking about the event is not enough. Make sure registration is only one click away. Leverage it with your newsletters. Your email newsletter is a great place to promote events because it reaches a wide audience. It takes advantage of the places they are already paying attention to. So these are the exact same reasons you should also promote your event on your website. With a lot of event management systems, it's easy to do this. It doesn't require constantly updating your web designer or swapping out code. It's a change you make once and it will update your website automatically for every new event you publish. And just like your email, registration is just one click away for making it easier for your audience. By promoting your event through your email newsletter and your website, you're taking advantage of the places your customers are already engaging and looking. So what about the places prospects are looking for events? That is where public listings come in. With online event management systems, you can push your event out automatically to sites like um, In America and Social Vents, that's S-O-C-I-A-L-V-E-N-T-S, and don't stop there. Make sure your local press covers your event as well, whether that's a paper, an event calendar, a co-marketing opportunity with local businesses, whatever the place. Make sure to get your event out there. So once you get the word out about your event and have generated buzz, the next step is to motivate people to register. Use all of the tools that you have the ability to, to use, starting with the registration form and event homepage you create. The event homepage is something um, that's often baked into an online event management and registration tool. So make sure all of the information is listed in those places, but we'll talk more about registration best practices in a minute. You then build on that buzz and drive registration through the invitations you send, whether they be virtual or through email or through snail mail or newsletters or, you know, using the USPS. Finally, take advantage of all of your social media channels, especially because they will help get word out to your events spread just beyond your loyal supporters and may encourage people to your organization to come along. Now, since um, they did mention snail mail, I just have to give you my personal opinion. I What fills all of my events um, my eBay workshops throughout Georgia and Florida, we pack the house, sometimes we have standing room only, and it's not only with my online registration, but it also is with, excuse me, using the postal service, it's called Every Door Direct Mail, and those cost about 18 cents um, a piece of paper, so I just wanted to mention that. You can do a search for Every Door Direct Mail, or I will, um, let me make a note. I will include a link in the newsletter follow-up. I'll get that added. It's called Every Door Direct Mail. It's just, just so that you can see that that's also an option as well because I combine it with my online scheduling. So let's see, where are we? That was a side note. <laughs> So maximize attendance two weeks out to the event. Send email reminders. A lot of times event promotion focuses on driving registration, 
but event attendance is even more important part of your promotional strategy. So let's take a look at best practices you can apply to maximize registration. There's no question you should send a reminder. However, you don't want to just settle for resending the event invitation. Don't pass up this opportunity to get them excited about attending, especially because it will be seen by a larger portion of your registrants. So each of our customers had over a 60% open rate. Be sure to include a link to a pre-event survey or a poll show event countdown, you could have a countdown to the event, provide the speaker information, whatever is appropriate, and make it easy for people to share. If, it, it, if your event requires a ticket for entry, then make sure to include a reminder for registrants to print out their ticket ahead of time. It's also a great reminder for them to attend and make your check-in process even easier. Although your event homepage link remains static, you could still update the page and make sure it has the most up-to-date information. So keep rotating the content so people want to come back and get registrants excited about the event. You can provide additional event info. You get more promotional real estate, etc. And don't forget to take advantage of your social channels We'll talk about the concept of social proof in a few minutes, but you'll see why leveraging the social visibility of your organization and your followers is so important. Now let's look at the benefits of and some best practices around online registration. One of the early choices you make as an event planner has to do with the tools you use to manage the various details of your event. There are two big buckets that we can place those tools in. And to put in simply, we refer to those as online and offline tools. To be clear, offline doesn't just equal paper. This refers to an entire mix of resources and other tools that you're likely using. In fact, in some recent research we conducted of customers using our event management tools, we found that a lot of them were using a mix. None of these are likely surprises. Excel spreadsheets, our telephone, our Outlook, or other email. These are all what we consider offline or indirect event management tools. We also refer to these as indirect methods because your invitees isn't registering directly into the event database. They reply to the invitation via phone, email, regular mail, et cetera, and then you or a member of your staff enters the data into the spreadsheet or the system. What you don't see here are things like paper invitations, save the date cards, et cetera, but these are important. But some, but not something we're going to discuss today. So to be clear, though, we're big fans of paper invitations because they can be artistic and exciting and can reflect your brand and the brand for your event. They can start to give the recipients a sense of long event long before the step into the room. So what we're focused on today are the online tools that, as we'll show, can help streamline the registration process by bringing together a number of different elements into the process and ultimately make your life as an event planner or manager easier. So let's take a look at what we mean when we say online registration. One of the early choices you make as an event planner has to do with the tools you use to manage the various details of your event. So there are two big buckets that we can place those tools in. And to put it simply, we refer to those as online and offline tools. Wait a minute. I think I missed something. Sorry, I'm <laughs> repeating myself. OK, first, I'm guessing. Most of you have seen or completed an online registration form. 
So, or may be familiar with the fact that activities that you do can be online can reflect in reporting from the online tool. Online registration is an electronic way to capture information about people coming to your event. During the act of registration, you can also capture fees, guest information, etc. Certain online registration tools may also automatically enter that information into a list you have or allow you to integrate with email and social media marketing tools. When we're talking about online registration, we refer to tools that you can use that allow you the point of event registration, including event details like meal selection or payments for attendance. So you may be wondering why you should use online registration tools, especially if you've already got a mix of tools that work for you, so that's great. But the reality of online registration tools is that they'll make life easier for you and your invitees. Easier refers to the fact that your registration process is now an engine switched that is always on and allows for the collection of more information than a simple yes, no, or maybe on an RSVP form or an invitation. It will be easier for you and others on how it's built. Invitation acceptances and declines can be pulled together quickly in one place. If you're charging a fee, a lot of online tools allow you to collect fees as part of the registration process. And you could be collecting those 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Of course, the best part is you don't actually have to collect, enter, or handle the information. It all goes directly into your database. Think of it like being a part of a conversation with your attendees, except you don't actually have to be there. And it happens at a time when your attendees want it to, which increases the likelihood they'll register because it happens on their schedule. So as I mentioned with my workshops with the Every Door Direct Mail, when those go out on the flyers that we created, there's a part on there that says, space is limited, register online at, and then it says, powersellingmom.com slash USPS. And that leads them, I get traffic to my website, and then they go to that page, they register for the event, and then I get an email, I have it set up so that I get an email every time someone registers, so I can kind of keep track. I also have an app on my phone that shows me updates on how many people are registered, it lets me see how, room, how big the room is getting, if I need to get more refreshments, I need to get more stuff, and it helps me monitor and keep track of the progress of the event. I love it. It's like having a personal assistant. So, if you want or even require, you can also sell items related to the event ahead of time or collect donations related to the cause, with all of that information ending up in one place. It's really, really convenient, seriously. In one word, online registration makes your life easier. And in my one word, actually, is it simplifies. It simplifies my system, and that's what I'm all about. Make it easy for me, make it fast, and Constant Contact becomes my virtual assistant with less, you know, paying some, paying about a body. I could just set it up myself. So in addition to be, being easier, you're also going to find that expectations around where registration takes place or have been change, charging or changing. Easier. I just want to add the word simpler. <laughs> Simplified. That's my word. So the more it's used, oh, my computer's messing up. 50% of invitees who receive paper invitees that want to register online, they're saying 50% 
So that is a really good um, breakdown, I think, with with using my every door direct mail in combination with um, the online registration. So keep it simple. Here's uh, what I what else I love about. I should have showed my own screen because on mine it'll show you the exact map. It'll show you it has everything for when the people go to register. You can see it an example if you want to go to my website because I, I have some events coming up. But it lets you create this page and then people can read all about it. They can see the map. They can see the address. It's very simple, easy to understand. It also lets me include my logo or a simple graphic if I want to add one. I just like to usually brand mine during holiday time. So mine, I think, now are like red, white, and blue, and um, they match the feeling of the United States Postal Service. They also include the event details. All of these things are right available for the, the registrant when they come to the page. I can have a message on why they need to attend, we can um, have different pieces of information, and it lets you even add links in there if you want to add more hot links to it. And also a reason why they can't attend will take them to, if they say, well, I don't want to go, and if they click that, it'll take them to another page. But the subject line, as always, just in email marketing is very important. So after crafting your invitation, you can start building out your registration form. The first thing to consider as you start building your registration form is that you don't want to make it difficult, complicated, or overly time-consuming for the invitee to complete the registration. This is an example of a form that just on appearance alone, you might consider not filling it out because it's like, oh my gosh, this looks crazy. It actually asks for 14 separate pieces of information. So there's an important point I need to make here, though. If your event requires you to ask for 14 pieces of information, then you should do it. But do everything to ensure that you're asking for only the information that is most necessary for you to have and most appropriately relevant to the event. So avoid the temptation to use the registration form as a vehicle for asking every question you ever wanted an answer to, or as a platform that gets you a lot of detail about the event or your organization. So you've worked really hard to develop your brand and to expose your brand personality in whatever you do, why wouldn't you take this opportunity to do that with your event registration as well? You should customize your registration so it reflects your brand. Use your logo, your colors. If using online registration, send from an email address that they will recognize as your organization. Don't use a different email address that throws people off. So, and also be sure to use a language that is appropriate for your organization. If you call people members, cozy knitters, business executives, etc., use this language so the registration form is customized to reflect your brand. One variation on this idea is to reflect the brand of the event especially if it has a different look or feel than your standard brands. In most cases, the event look and feel will incorporate your organization's brand, so it should be easy to match to the event. As with the innovation, there are, or the invitation, there are some basics to consider for your registration form or page. Don't worry 
We'll get the information you want to collect in a moment, but don't forget the basics. The logo, the graphics, the name. Make sure that everything you create has your logo. Don't assume that just because they clicked on a link or found themselves on a registration page, they know or remember who you are. Provide all the details, the date, the time, the location, and most I know Constant Contact has a built-in map that automatically appears that, that pulls in from Google. And so the people can find it just at a glance. So have, keep your form fields as simple as possible. Recognize that the amount of information flying at people these days, you want to take every opportunity to remind them of who you are and what they're signing up for. And again, just bottom line, keep it simple. So what information should you seek to collect? Well, let's talk about that. How much and what information you collect is a tricky question to answer. As I said, the short answer is that you want to collect only as much information as you need in order to effectively manage the event. So for example, here are some common questions asked on registration forms. Notice that there isn't a long list of items here because people are time starved and information overloaded and that includes being asked to fill out forms, enter their data, if you're clearly soliciting information that is connected to the event, then you're likely to get a good com completion rate. Be aware that there's plenty of research to support this fact, that the longer a form is, the higher chance that someone will not complete it. So even if there are questions you want to ask related to your business or organization, but they're not relevant, you should find a different approach for asking them. Try collecting the bare minimum of information needed and make sure there's an exposure or there's a purpose for everything you collect. Don't ask for information you're not going to use. So, demographics. This can help you plan or adjust your entertainment, your auction items, an audience that has more women than men, for example, could lead you to make different choices than if they were the other way around. If you're allowing guests, collect that information, especially so that you can manage your seating and your event capacity. If you have different session options, asking ahead of time what your attendings will do to help you communicate about openings, adjust staffing, and even remove talk up different um, options. All of the event specification, specific information that you may want will clearly help you manage the details like meal options, clothing sizes, quantities, even help you better understand the makeup of your audience. This is where the how did you hear about our event question can help you see if you have a high number of returning customers, VIPs, or new supporters coming to your event, allowing you to adjust your remarks, etc. Payment is clearly important, and if you're collecting payments and your payment information ahead of time, you'll be able to manage your event budget and finances Knowing what a large number of your registrants plan to pay at the door may impact how you pay for certain aspects of the event in advance, which is also important because you don't want to cut yourself short. So what should you collect? So this can be tricky, as I said earlier, but you can go through and make this decision that will complement your event. Also, if they, you will want to ask if they have food or allergy issues. And that's one thing that I always do ask before um, people come to my home office for private um, 
um, workshops because I always include a meal at my workshop. So I always have to make sure to check on food allergies and also if they're allergic to cats or <laughs> because I have two cats that live in our house and God forbid something should happen. So these are just a few things that um, I did mention earlier. I mentioned asking about a meal, a giveaway, are they vegetarian? Ask about things that might seem unrelated that will actually help, like the, the are they allergic to the animals? Again, the key takeaway here is to make sure you're asking for information that's relevant to the event. So once you have the set of questions you want to ask with online tools, there's another important consideration that you want to make, one that will help you better use, have better use of that information. So, boy, my computer is running slow. Now we've got to collect the data. Now, we've got the questions you want to ask, so when, then you just build out the form, provided space for the answers, and you're off and running, right? Well, wrong. <laughs> Here's an example of a form that might have been created that way. Clearly, there's a lot of information they want to collect, and they've provided ample space for those answers, but what's wrong with this picture? There are these are all open-ended questions. Why is it, why is that a problem? Because as registrants complete and submit their answers, you'll get a spreadsheet that looks like this. This is a set of data that will be hard for you to process or analyze easily because of the variety of the answers, types of quest, types of answers. So you have a lot of cleanup work in this spreadsheet before you can make the most effective use of it. So keep that in mind. When you're creating these questions, they're going to go into a spreadsheet for you to review later. So you don't want to make more work for yourself. The best approach is to provide options in response to each question. So look at this form and how the event manager has made it easy for the registrants by asking for yes, no answers, or providing a selection of responses in a drop-down menu. Then when the event manager looks at the data, they'll find a very clean data set that can be easily sorted, filtered, analyzed, et cetera, making it easier to make decisions, changes in that event strategy, et cetera. So remember, good data in equals good data out. So here's another time-sensitive piece of advice. Make yourself the first test subject for your registration form. Even before you send out your invita invitation, be sure that you fill out the form yourself or have members of your staff fill it out. This will allow you to make sure it's easy to understand and complete, doesn't have any typos or other kinds of errors, and get a sense of how long it would take to complete. You can then have assess if the time it takes is appropriate for the event or your audience. Once you have a good sense of the time it takes, you could even comment in um, in the invite or at the start of the registration pro process. This should only take three minutes to complete or 15 minutes to complete or 30 minutes to complete, whatever, however long it takes, it'll help. Because I know personally, if I, when I get surveys, the first thing I think of is, oh, how long is that going to take? But if it says at the top, this will take you three minutes, chances are I'm going to fill it out. So you came up with the questions, you built a good form to collect the information, you tested it, and now it's live. Now what? One thing you can do is ask your registrants if they'd like others to see that they're attending. 
So with most online registration tools, you can set this up as you set up everything else for your event, your registration, registration form. Then when the registrants get to the end of the form, they will be asked if they want to share their registration with others with limited information. If and when they allow that other registrants will see how your event's audience is shaping up, resulting in an experience that has the names visible to people that have registered. This is actually a great practice as it will help create something known as social proof. So what is social proof? It's a phenomenon by which someone looks to see how others are responding to a particular situation, decision, etc. before they make their own. Think of it when you're at a when you're at a restaurant and found that the parking lot empty. Do you wonder if the food is any good? Will you drive on to one with a full parking lot? What happens is that one of your invitees will get to the registration form and see that list of names. She'll look at the list of names and try to find people that she knows that have similar interests, are all part of the process of deciding whether or not they want to attend. If she sees enough of the social proof, she'll be more inclined to think that this is an event worth attending and she'll complete the registration. Now, to extend the proof, as I say, the proof is in the pudding. <laughs> Something that you need to keep in mind, though, with respect to payment options is that if you only offer one payment option, people may opt out of the registration at that point. Oh, I guess I skipped a screen. Sorry, sorry. So the social proof, the other thing that I just wanted to mention was that they will share and share it with their friends. That's the other cool part. So things beyond the event, they are going to bring guests and so on. Gosh, did we already do this? All right, payment, there we are. If you decided to collect payment, consider the impact on how you will allow them to pay or make donations. If they pay by check or credit card are common options with a lot of small businesses using credit processors, authorized.net, ProPay, PayPal, they're all seamless. And you might find that an online payment solution like Google Checkout or PayPal would work better for you. PayPal works great for me. Just keep in mind that in most cases like these will take your registrants out of your registration form and do a separate website. Also, depending on the type of event and the audience, you may want to offer the option to pay at the door. So that I do offer that sometimes as well. Although, if you do pay at the door, um, make sure that you have some help helping you because it gets kind of hectic with doing it yourself. Okay, the post event. Now flash forward to the day after your event, you're all done, right? You cleaned up, now you get to go on vacation. But not yet. There are still some important steps to make sure you close out the event as a marketing campaign. So the most important thing is to say thank you. Thank you for coming to my event. And it's really important that you have follow-up. Some of the tools you can use to plan and promote events, return your results, and others take about 24 hours. And the ones that I use, you'll get a, a replay of this recording within a couple hours. So some tools 
like for our webinars, they can take a little bit longer for the recordings to process. But in either case, once the event is concluded, you can go ahead and check your results and reporting and get a few different things. I can pull a list of attendees and no-shows, people that registered and didn't show up today. That's okay. Once I have my list, I can send an email to the attendees and to the registrants that didn't attend and make sure that you do this, when you do this, you have a, a further step. So I can use these reporting features to check on different things. There's just so much opportunity with the reporting features. So soon after the event, connect with your attendees, staff, and volunteers. Ask them to share any multimedia they captured. Make it easy for them to share by inviting them to post photos on Facebook or any social channel that you use. Create albums where you can, and then send a link to your online album to your follow-up. All of my eBay workshops, I put, I create an album for the workshop, and then I post all the all of the pictures into that album, and then I share that album with um, the postal service and people that attend it. So if you provide your event attendees with a hashtag for your event as well as the, the key social media addresses that you've provided them with, a great tool to share their experience and a great way for you to check on social visibility that took place during the event. So you can review the results of your event social media activity pretty easily through most of the channels. You can take a look at when the tweets were posted, compare them to the times of different activities that took place, what parts of your event or session speakers got the most, attention, Twitter. It just helps you be able to take a look at everything. Actually, what I do, too, is, is I set my tweets up ahead of time so that I tweet during my event. I schedule them to go out, but that's another, that's another workshop. So get feedback with a survey. This is another, you could develop a satisfaction score. Over time, the score can help you collaborate your efforts and planning going forward and make changes to the elements of your next event so that you can make sure that they're provided with the best experiences. So you can ask a range of questions, gain valuable insights. Do they would they like to come back at a different time of the year? These are all the kinds of things. Do they enjoy the speaker, the presentation? Were they interested? And then would they like to subscribe to your newsletter? That is a given. You, you need to always ask them to subscribe so that they can get more information. And you can continue to build your list. So I know I put a lot of information in front of you today, and I know it's not easy to keep all this straight. So now we're just going to run through some checklists that can help you keep in mind as you review some of the key points we discussed today. So the registration, the invitations and registration, make sure the host organizers is very obvious, not just the logo, place your logo left or center, include the date, time, topic, Sign-up link should be most obvious, if not only option, and be above the scroll line. Don't give details that distract from the sign-up form. Also, don't forget to send a reminder email. Reconfirm the registration. Note if there is a waiting list or the event is full. I actually have mine set up to um, like I'll say the room capacity is 60 and then it'll automatically put into a waiting list and that helps me stay on track. Describe the check-in process, where to park, what to bring, emergency contact information. Where to park is a very helpful. I know I had an event at a library once that parking was limited. So this can be a long email really. No, we don't want a long email. Provide as much information as you need only. If it has to be a long email, so be it. 
your follow-up email, thank you, thank you, thank you. Include at least one photo from the event and ask them to share it. Ask them to participate in the survey. Ask attendees to tweet, post, and don't forget if you have a hashtag. So we discussed, oh, and then your call to action at the event, donate, visit, sign up. We discussed the decision to use offline, online, and recognize the three of the big advantages of the tools. And they are easily processing, collecting RSVPs, fees, and other information related to the event. Online tools are available 24-7. Remember we talked about it's like having a conversation. It's like having a virtual assistant. And online tools bring the various elements of your process together into one place making it easier for you to manage. When it comes to the registration form itself, only collect what you need. Keep it simple. Get your data in and your data out. Promote social proof. And use data to inform future business decisions for your next event. When it comes to the registration form itself, remember to have your brand, your logo, and various elements of your process. Make sure they know it's you. Payment options matter. When you think about your pricing and other options, consider what is best, not just for you, but for your intended audience. Provide as many options that are reasonable. And timing matters as well. So provide enough time for your invitees to plan accordingly. Make travel or financial plans so that it's easy for them to say yes to your invitation. And don't forget to send them reminders. They are busy people. So if you want to take constant contact for a spin, we do provide all of these services, starting with the basic at 20. I recommend the 45 essential because it allows you the um, the capabilities of doing so much more. And you'll see that there is the breakdown because my favorite is autoresponders. I'm a huge fan of autoresponders. And I have a workshop on autoresponders actually too. So anyone that's in my umbrella will be able to come join me at my Facebook group. And it's just at facebook.com slash group slash constant contact one. I'm available for free coaching and free questions and whatever help you need when you are under my umbrella in my group. And I will send you more information about that as well. Meanwhile, I'm going to stop the recording. I, I know I kind of speeded it up a little bit as I noticed we were into the hour here. So it was a lot of information. I'm going to stop the recording, and then I will take questions. So thank you for joining me today. My name is Dana Crawford. You can find more information about me online. And if you are listening in the archives, the link will be provided below. Thank you.